Will you marry me? I have money. The hot, fit woman asking for my hand in marriage was holding a tight roll of American currency in her hand. Girls giving me money and asking me for marriage is not something I encounter often. In this regard, the big question arises, why? Was her request that we marry in marital bliss because of my stunning looks? I could hardly be said to be strong and fit, being just over five foot six inches tall, but at best, my appearance could be described as ordinary or ordinary. I had the most forgetful face, one of thousands of nameless, ordinary people you would never notice in a crowd. Mr. Average, in height, weight, hair color, etc. I would make an excellent spy, able to sneak in and escape without anyone knowing I was there. Then, my beautiful sports car must have caught her attention. No, the four-year-old diesel Volkswagen Jetta is hardly a baby magnet. Perhaps it was my living conditions. A huge mansion on the seashore with a yacht? Guess again. I lived in the same old house in which my grandparents raised me and which they left to me after their death. The house was a nice place in a middle-income area, but there was nothing in it that could attract the attention of such a beautiful lady. Surely my jet-setting lifestyle coupled with enormous wealth was attractive. That must be it. Mistake. As a 27-year-old charity group organizer, I made about the same as a McDonald's manager. As someone low on the totem pole, my focus wasn't on glitzy galas, but on fun 10-foot dashes and cold calling. Usually ladies of this caliber don't even notice me. They may talk to me to ask for directions, or if they need someone to carry their bags on a nice day. So what could I have that would attract this baby? Well, I was in an organization that was exclusive to several million people. My ancestors managed to avoid being crushed, eaten, drowned, starved, stranded, bogged, untimely wounded, and delivered a tiny burst of genetic material to the right partner, at the right time, and in the right place. Yes, I was a passport holder, a true American citizen born in the USA. The big bonus was that I was also a single, unmarried man. Now I'm not bragging. I have nothing to do with this. In most countries of the world, American citizenship means nothing, and neither does having brown hair. In other parts of the world, being American is a bad thing. But now, in this place, for some people, especially the woman in front of me, being a single American man was a currency and a barter to trade. The woman in question was called Pia. She was a classic Asian beauty. Just over five feet four inches tall, Pia had long, straight hair, high cheekbones, and features that, coupled with a dazzling smile, lit up the room. Paired with a body to die for, Pia was slim, sexy, and managed to rock jumpsuits. Ron, listen to me. Pia's voice floated through my thoughts as she handed over the money. Pia, I tried not to laugh. I can't marry you. We barely know each other. You've known me for a long time, Ron, Pia said stubbornly. Do you want more money? I'll get more. I will ask Mr. Wilson's adult children for more severance pay to leave. Pia was my housemate, Mr. Wilson's carer for the last few years until his death last month. Pia was a home health aide, nurse, cook, maid, assistant, companion. Mr. Wilson was my soccer coach when I was a kid. I knew Pia quite well. She came to me whenever she had some work to do or a home renovation she couldn't do. A common act of a good neighbor. However, the marriage went a little beyond the scope of good neighborliness. Pia, I shook my head. You're just a treasure. I'm very flattered. What reason could you have for marrying me? American Immigration and Naturalization Service. Pia spat out something in her native language. I don't think it was a compliment to this government agency. The Immigration Service gave me 90 days to return home. They said my visa was no longer valid. Mr. Wilson's children are not helping. They want to sell the house. Mr. Wilson's kids give me money. I give it to you. You marry me, Ron. It's not about the money. You can't marry a person you don't love. Trust me, there is someone who will love you. With your looks, you can get any guy. Pia waved her hand. Ron, I don't have time for love. I need a good man. You are a good man. 
Do you want to spend the rest of your life with a person you don't love? I asked it. Pia looked at me strangely. Why do you say, marry it all your life? I saw a lawyer about immigration. He said we only needed to be married for two years. I will leave to marry a better man than you, who is waiting for me at home. Now I had to laugh. Pia, you're just smart. How can I refuse an offer that makes me feel like I'm not only in second place, but also losing to some guy I've never met? Why not just go home to Mr. Wonderful now and live happily ever after? Pia stamped her foot. Why are you so stubborn? I need to stay in America, earn money for my mother and sister. I send all the money home, pay for my sister's school. My mother needs medicine. She is still alive. Do you want more money? I'm trying to get more. Mother dies. I don't send money home. My sister will end up on the street. Great, I thought. Now I will kill her mother and make her family homeless. Pia, I tried to bargain with her. I told you it's not about the money. If I marry you the way you want, it's called fraud. We'll both go to jail. How will you help your mother and sister if you end up in an American prison and then get deported? There was no stopping her. If immigration sends me home, I still won't be of any use to my mother and sister. Who cares if we get married? Everything is fine. I see your house. You need a good woman. I'm a good woman. I cook well. I take care of you. You won't regret it. Pia, I began. You're crazy. She looked desperate, and to be honest, I wouldn't have minded eating something without a microwave. Plus, Pia was nice to look at. I tried to let her go, and besides, this conversation led nowhere. Let me think about it. We will talk about it later. I thought that Pia would forget about this stupid idea or I would just avoid her. Pia surprised me by pushing a wad of bills into my hand. You need to think fast. Mr. Wilson's kids want me gone by the weekend. I threw the roll of bills back to Pia. Listen, Pia, I won't take your money. I turned and walked towards my house. I didn't need Pia's money. Little did anyone know this, but I was a trust fund baby. No, not from a multimillionaire's trust fund. My grandfather, many years ago, developed the key ingredient for the famous regional soft drink. The trust fund received a small percentage of sales, according to some complex formula, each year. Every March, I received a check. It wasn't enough for me to travel the world and gamble in Monte Carlo, but it was more than enough for me to supplement the income from any job I wanted. The trust money gave me time, time to do what I wanted. I learned to fly, learned several martial arts, learned to paint, renovate houses, do first aid, and tried my hand at music. I donated regularly to several charities and community organizations, all anonymously. At the age of 17, my grandfather taught me a valuable lesson. I just received my first trust check. Naturally, this was a down payment on a new expensive car, parties with girls and drinks. In the third month of my drunken sailor spending, my grandfather froze my bank account and took my car. It was a sobering experience to see my friends disappear like snowflakes on a warm sidewalk. I didn't tell anyone else about my trust and lived within my means. I was amazed at the human nature of people, especially women. Girls would swoon over some guy who had a fancy car and credit cards, and I couldn't get service from a pretty bank teller until she discovered I had over six figures in my account. I have yet to meet a girl for whom form is not more important than function. Because of my lifestyle, several girlfriends left me. Often, after several dates, I was told, Ron, you're a good guy, but you have such an ordinary loser's job. You're not going anywhere. I deserve better. I was okay with sex. I never had to pay for it. But while I was looking for Miss Wright, they were all looking for Mr. Wright now, or a guy who could, as one popular movie said, show me the money. One night stands are fun, but they're outdated. It seemed impossible to find a single member of the opposite sex who was not superficial. The next morning, Pia showed up at my doorstep with several suitcases and boxes. I watched in amazement as Pia stacked her things in my living room. Ron, Pia said, between steps from the porch to the living room. I'll stay here while you think. You will see that life is much better with me as your wife. Damn it, Pia, I began and looked at my watch. 
I was late for an important meeting. You can't stay here. Don't do anything until I return in the evening. Yes, Ron, yes, yes, Pia replied, ignoring me. You go to work, we say when you return. Go, go now. She pushed me out the door. That evening, I came home with a speech planned out. I had to be firm, but soft. Pia can stay for a few days, but not get married. I'll ask the lawyers who manage my trust fund if they could consider helping Pia with her visa, but that's it. When I walked through the door, something changed. It took me a few seconds, but I caught it. The house was spotlessly clean. I mean, I'm not a slob, but this was the cleanest house since my grandmother died. In addition, there was a wonderful smell coming from the kitchen. Pia magically appeared, holding a wooden spoon. It's good that you're home. Pia came up and kissed my stunned face. I didn't find a rice cooker in the kitchen. I took Mr. Wilson's rice cooker. He's dead. He doesn't need a rice cooker. Where's your rice cooker? Pia waved her spoon at me. I managed to make my lips even bigger. I don't have a rice cooker. I should have Uncle Ben's instant rice in the cupboard. Boil water and throw a bag of rice into it for two minutes. Bingo. You have rice. Pia looked shocked. Ron, this is not rice. You need a rice cooker. Pia pointed with a spoon. You go and get yourself in order. Food will be on the table. Hurry up. The food is getting cold. It smelled good. There's no reason why my speech couldn't wait until after dinner. Another surprise awaited me in the bedroom. I opened the dresser drawer. The socks were neatly folded, even linted up. But something was wrong. I took a pair of socks and underwear. Damn Pia, she eroded my socks and underwear. Dinner was excellent. Some kind of fish on a bed of boiled rice with salad. The dessert was excellent, a fruit cocktail like I've never seen before. Pia kept asking me about my day, and I realized that I liked talking to her. Pia seemed to understand the people I was working with and offered ideas I had never thought of about the clients and problems I was describing. Pia even told some funny stories that created a good mood at the table. Well, now is the right time. I could have ended this and started my speech, but Pia interrupted me. Ron will have time to talk later, but now go for a walk outside. Not fat, good for health. That's right, Pia, I said. Let's go enjoy this wonderful evening. You go, Pia objected. I'll clean up the kitchen first. I enjoyed my walk around the block. Pia joined me, we chatted and walked around nicely. It was a nice feeling. I didn't want to spoil the mood. Deciding that I would clarify the situation with Pia in the morning, we headed back to my house. Later that evening, I climbed into bed, and Pia was in the hall shower singing. She had a musical voice with an almost perfect pitch. I decided that Pia would sleep in one of the three available bedrooms. I had slept naked myself for many years and reminded myself to put on a robe whenever I left the bedroom for any reason. When I was almost asleep, when I felt a warm body lift the blanket and sneak into my bed, Pia pressed her whole body against me. Since I'm a guy, you can guess my first reaction to seeing tight female curves squirming against my rapidly awakening areas. Pia. I started trying to turn away, hiding my erection. There are three more bedrooms. I can move if you want to sleep here. Silly Ron, Pia said, licking my ear. No other bed has what this one has. With that, Pia dove under the covers, fulfilling my fantasy since the day I first saw her. Only Pia in real life was much better than all my fantasies. It wasn't the quick thank you for dinner and date that I was used to from previous women. Pia teased me that if they gave out medals, Pia would get a gold and a silver. She never let me please her, but I slept soundly with the biggest smile on my face. The next morning, I was able to cross one item off my bucket list. This point was waking up with pleasure. The mornings kept getting better. No cold cornflakes for me. Pia peeled fresh fruit while she baked some pastries. I never got to give my speech to Pia. I barely made it to work on time. I lasted four days before Pia and I were married in a civil ceremony at the courthouse. Before you think I've drained all the blood from my brain, I hired a trust-recommended law firm to draft a prenuptial agreement. It was over a hundred pages long, 
and laid out in great detail who would get what, when, and in the event of a separation. We weren't talking about a two-year agreement. I had to get Pia a lawyer to review the document for her. Ron, why are we spending money on a lawyer? Pia asked. You are a good person. You will not deceive me. Besides, I really enjoyed being with Pia. I learned that she grew up in a fishing port on the outskirts of the city. Her father disappeared one day at sea, leaving behind her mother, Pia, and her little sister. Mom was determined to achieve success for her daughters. School and grades were religion. At the age of 11, Pia's mother took her to a moneylender. The moneylender agreed to give an advance on the school, at rates that would make a mafia moneylender blush. Pia had to repay the loan after graduating from school and starting work. If Pia fails her studies, she will have to pay back the money by working in a brothel, also owned by a loan shark. If Pia misses the payment deadline, Pia's younger sister will be taken to the brothel as payment. In her country, Pia received a nursing degree and went to America. Unfortunately, Pia was unable to pass the certification to become a nurse. The foreign nurse certification and approval process was expensive. Pia sent every cent home to pay off a loan, send her sister to school, and pay for the medications her mother needed to treat her illness. Her boyfriend, Mr. Wonderful, was a young man she had known since childhood. Pia's eyes lit up every time she talked about Mr. Wonderful. He works on a fishing boat, Pia boasted when I foolishly asked about him. He will have his own fishing boat, and then many boats. We will have many children, many boys, and a big house near the market. Sounds like a real gem, I said sarcastically. I wondered how I could be jealous of a guy I had never met. Oh, he's the best man. Pia continued, not missing a single blow. We are waiting for each other. We made a promise to each other. This promise was the only thing I could complain about. Otherwise, I was living in a beer commercial and Pia was the wife of my dreams, at least for a while. But it is human nature to covet what we see but cannot have. Pia was hardworking and outside the home. No grass grew under her feet. When she wasn't working as a house help, Pia did anything, anything, to make money. Pseudo Mary Kay cosmetics, Tupperware parties, selling jewelry, and money changers. If it was possible to make money from it, Pia did it. Pia also bargained better than any Turkish horse trader. The only money Pia took from me was the money I gave her for food. Pia drove her little car to the farmer's or fish market. No grocery stores with high prices and junk for us. Upon returning, Pia's car was filled with fresh food. Pia always brought change from her grocery trips. I don't think the woman slept more than four hours a night. I never saw her buy anything new for herself, but Pia scoured flea markets and thrift stores, coming up with outfits that made her look even more beautiful. We had a joke that I had never seen Pia looking bad or not wearing makeup. Every morning, Pia got up before me and did her makeup and hair. Several times, I even set the alarm at an odd hour, trying to catch Pia with bed hair or with light eyes. This never happened. And yet, Pia was full of surprises. One day after yet another award-winning below-the-belt pleasure, I just had to ask. Pia, I began, lying on the bed with a wide smile on my face. How did you get so good at this? I put my finger to her lips. Are you and Mr. Wonderful at home? Or American boyfriends? Pia pressed herself close to me. No, never, answered Pia. I'm a good girl. I had never kissed a man until I came to America. I don't have boyfriends. Mr. Wilson showed me how it's done. I sat up straight in bed. Mr. Wilson, I stuttered. Our deceased neighbor, damn. You kept an eye on that old bastard in his dying days, and this is how he repays you. I was furious. How could my old football coach take advantage of a young, respectable girl like that? What an asshole. It's a good thing he was dead, otherwise I would have killed him. Pia, did that old bastard force you? Pia looked at me in confusion. Why are you angry? Pia stroked my stomach. Mr. Wilson didn't force me to do anything. I did this to avoid being beaten by Mr. Wilson. Pia, what the hell are you talking about? Now I was confused. Are you listening? Pia continued to rub me. Mr. Wilson was sometimes sick, but he was still a man. 
After his wife died, he was lonely and in need. Mr. Wilson went around and found bad women on the street and in the newspapers. Not often, but sometimes. Then Mr. Wilson was beaten up twice by different bad ladies and he lost all the money in his wallet. Pia moved the blankets on the bed. I didn't want Mr. Wilson to get hurt, but I knew Mr. Wilson was still a man. I watched the video and saw how much pleasure they give. Mr. Wilson fought me. For the first time. He made me stop. Kicked me out of the room. Told me he would fire me if I tried this again. I knew it wasn't true. I caught Mr. Wilson sleeping in bed. He was happy. I finished before he woke up. Mr. Wilson was still angry and scolded me, but he didn't fight anymore. I asked what he wanted and we argued for a long time, but he didn't say any more. But in the end, Mr. Wilson remained a man, and I protected him from all the bad women and beatings. Jesus Christ, Pia, I said, rubbing my chin. I hope this wasn't in your original job description. Then a thought occurred to me. You don't... You don't ensure the safety of other men by working as a housewife or other jobs? Pia wrinkled her brow in surprise. I am a wife, and I give you pleasure only as long as I am a wife. I don't do anything for anyone except my husband. Pia was so focused that her face looked absolutely wonderful, and I started laughing in spite of myself. Maybe Wilson was an old horned goat, but I knew that I couldn't hold out for long against the determined Pia. Perhaps it was a sham marriage, but for pizza's sake, I tried to keep up appearances. Pia was well connected to various Asian communities. Every weekend she had a wedding, baptism, anniversary, birthday, or other party. Pia elevated networking to a high art. She seemed to know everyone and everything that was going on. But I liked something else. People and their attitude to business. They didn't live to work, they worked to live. I mean, they worked a lot. No doubt most of them had more than one job. However, they put family and friends first, not career advancement or the corporate rat race. I had more fun with Pia at a backyard party than at some fancy gala. No one cared about your jewelry or the car you arrived in. They were just glad you came. I'll miss this when Pia and I go our separate ways. Our two-year agreement was coming to an end. With less than two months left, I quietly asked my lawyers to prepare the divorce papers. Even though the prenuptial agreement did not give Pia anything, I included a good amount for her in it. She will only find out about this after we break up. Pia was a proud lady, bearing half of the household expenses. Pia wouldn't let me return her money. At first, I tried to secretly return the money to Pia's purse. However, Pia always knew down to the penny how much money she had, so it didn't work. I resorted to the lie that the house expenses were small, but Pia found the utility bills and insisted on paying her share. I ended up taking the money Pia gave me and putting it into an account so I could give it back to her after the divorce. I also did things like fill up her car with the five gallons of gas I kept in the garage. Pia never noticed that her car got better mileage than an all-electric hybrid. I was also able to convince Pia that I had a friend who owed me a favor, so I was able to put new tires on her car and rebuild her car from the gas tank to the transmission, without complaint. The only thing that didn't sit well with Pia was that every couple of weeks, I would come home with gift cards that were accidentally left over from a charity event. Yes, it was a little white lie, but I was really starting to love Pia and was ready to do anything to see her smile. Pia had a temporary green card, which gave her resident alien status. When Pia suddenly began to get nervous and act out of sorts, I attributed it to the upcoming separation. Over the past few days, Pia has been dressing better than usual, cooking my favorite meals, even increasing our activities in the bedroom. Ron, Pia began at dinner, sitting across the table from me. I need one more favor from you. Okay, Pia, I replied. Tell me what you need. I need to bring my mother and sister to America, Pia said hastily. The lawyer told me that my money is not enough to, as you say, sponsor my mother and sister. We filed our income tax return as estranged spouses. Most of Pia's work and income were in cash. Pia, in a heartbeat, would give any friend dollars for a dress for her daughter at church or for a wedding reception or for any other request. 
but Pia hated giving money to some government machine that she did not know and did not trust. Pia, I laughed at her. I told you that unreported income would come back to bite you on your sweet ass one day. What do you want me to do about it? Why should I give money to thieving politicians? Pia held the same opinion about government officials that all people in the world share. They say I need money from your work to sponsor my mother and sister. If we are going to get divorced in a few weeks, then my declared income from work will not bring you any benefit then. Ron, Pia looked down, nervously picking at her food. We must remain married until my mother and sister come to America. This is a turn of events, Pia. I was a little taken aback. What time period are we talking about? Not long, Ron. Pia brightened up, seeing that I didn't brush her off. The lawyer says that perhaps a year and a half, maximum two years. She smiled at me, hopefully. I pretended to consider her request. There is something to think about here. What does Fisherman Mr. Wonderful think of this delay? Pia waved her hand dismissively. This is family. Family comes first. He understands. He is waiting for me. On my part, the choice was small. Go back to microwave dinners and wash my own clothes, chasing indifferent ladies on the one hand, or live longer, fantasies with Pia on the other. I sighed dramatically. Okay, Pia. I think we can tolerate each other a little longer. Pia's face broke into a classic smile that lit up the room, and she went back to eating. Barely breathing, I heard Pia say. Thank you, Ron. About six months after this conversation, our relationship went very wrong. I was at a local sports bar that was having a fundraiser. My old college team was playing and had a winning season. In the past, my former school was not known for its sports program. It was a decade of recovery. The sports bar manager and assistant manager were ladies who attended the rival team's school. In the bar, bets were made on drinks, and patrons took sides. Drinks and money were gambled on every aspect of the competition to be donated to charity. I'm not a big drinker. A beer or glass of wine with dinner was my limit. After a few drinks, I remember locking my lips with one of the girls after an exciting game on the bar TV. But that was it, until I woke up in my bed with a major league hangover. Ron, wake up. Pia shook me. Her words seemed to ring in my head like little hammers. Damn it, Pia. I tried to cover my head with a pillow. I'm the walking dead. Can't you leave me alone? We're going, Ron. Take your car. I have a lot of things to do today. Pia took the pillow off my head. She handed me a glass of water and an aspirin. Pia didn't look happy. After I stumbled out of the shower, Pia put me in her car to take me to the sports bar to pick up my car. Pia was unusually taciturn. Finally, halfway to her destination, Pia unloaded. Ron, why do you behave badly with bad girls? Pia began. I'm losing face. I come for you. Find you drunk with bad girls, tied up like two snakes in mating season. I was in no mood to talk. Leave it. It's part of my job to be at such events. You know it. It's not part of the job to put your wife in a bad light, to lose face. Pia spat. Are you talking about losing face? I objected. What about how you light up and then run through the air for days after you receive a letter from Mr. Wonderful Fisherman? How do you think I feel after this? I know that you keep all his letters in a box and reread them. Is this how a wife behaves? Ron, it's different, Pia replied, but slowed down a little. I make sure you are never around when I read letters. I never let you lose face. I am your wife. What you did is not the same. I am not happy. If you're not happy, you should think about another job. Try selling oranges on the freeway. My head still hurts. Besides, you are my wife in name only. The rest of you belong to Mr. Wonderful Fisherman at home. Pia looked straight ahead while driving. Ron, are you saying that I don't make you happy? You always seem happy with what we do. We were in a sports bar. I was looking in my pocket for my car keys. I wasn't in the best mood. Look, Pia... You really make me happy most of the time, but this two-year drought is the longest I've gone without real sex. And by real sex, I mean intercourse, not something you do. 
Pia didn't answer me as I slipped out of her car and slammed the door. The next day, the electricity was cut off in our office. We were all released from work early and sent home. As I approached the house, I was surprised to see Pia's car. Thought she had a home care job today. As I walked up the stairs to my bedroom, I heard sounds that made my heart sink. They were muffled, but they were the unmistakable sounds of sex. The feminine sounds were ones that Pia had never made for me. Pia even turned on the music, and I felt uneasy. I stopped at the bedroom door. Did I want to come in? We were married in name only. I don't know what angered me more, the fact that Pia had been teasing me for the past two years, or her pompous speech in the car yesterday about how she had lost face and was saving herself. What nonsense. I decided not to barge in or confront Pia. I went to get my camera, checked that there was film and flash, and then opened the door to the bedroom. I would send a beautiful portrait of her to Mr. Wonderful Fisherman. I was ready to see Pia in bed with some man in a fit of passion. What I saw was even more stunning. Pia was sitting on the bed, fully dressed, with a notepad on her lap and a pen in her hand. An intimate video was shown on TV. Pia held the VHS remote control close to her. From time to time, Pia paused the tape to record something and even rewinded the tape to different points. A stack of tapes was stacked on the bed next to her. Pia was sitting with her back to the door, so she didn't see me. After a moment, I quietly closed the door. Now I was really puzzled. What the hell is Pia doing now? I thought. Whatever it is, I better wait to find out. I walked down the stairs and out the front door. What Pia had in mind didn't take me long. When I returned later at my usual time, Pia met me at the door in a short nightie and kissed me passionately. Ron, I missed you so much, Pia said, batting her eyelashes. We'll go to the bedroom immediately. She turned towards me and wiggled her tight ass. I had to suppress my laughter. These conversations coming from Pia were more than funny. Well, I don't know, I played along. I am very tired. Pia was unstoppable. Oh, Ron, we're going. You've been wanting to get involved with me for a long time now. Now it was my turn to be surprised. Pia wanted me to have sex with her? Are you sure about this? I asked her. Pia's eyes flashed with fear for a moment, but she continued her chatter. Oh, yes, Ron, I'm all yours. I pulled Pia onto my lap and kissed her face. Okay, Pia, I said. But no pun intended, we'll do it my way. First of all, no more fake talk. I want my wife back. I picked Pia up. She weighed less than a hundred pounds when she was wet. He carried her up the stairs and set her down in the bedroom. Pia, just put on a robe, nothing else. Then meet me in the bathroom in the hall. Pia started to speak, but I interrupted her. No questions, Pia. Just do it. When Pia entered the bathroom, I was having a warm bath with scented beads. Oh, Ron, Pia cooed as she sank into the water. It's nice. Okay, Pia, I said, turning to leave. Stay there and soak until I get back. I returned 25 minutes later. Pia was so relaxed she was almost like jelly when I pulled her out of the bath and wrapped her in a large towel. I carried Pia into the bedroom and laid her on the bed. Pia looked around the room. It was lit by burning candles scattered around the room. I used a bunch of thick candles that we had stored for use during power outages. Quiet music was playing from the stereo system. He took off his boxers, climbed onto the bed, and kissed Pia on the lips, stroking her breasts. I moved down her body, kissing every inch with my mouth. Pia made soothing sounds, but when I moved below her chest, Pia opened her eyes. Ron, no, not there. Pia ran her hands through my hair. Shh, Pia, I assured her. Don't worry. Trust me. Pia's body tensed for a moment, then relaxed. She nodded her head and lay down on her back. Not for the first time, I fell asleep with a smile on my face. Life was going well. Pia hurried to the mailbox every day, looking for news of her mother and sister's request for immigration services. As far as I know, Pia still wrote and received letters from the fisherman Mr. Wonderful. This bothered me. 
but I decided that he only received paper letters from Pierre once every few weeks, while I had Pierre in real life every day, for now. Overall, I believed that at this point, I had the better side of the deal. After about 18 months, a letter arrived from the Immigration Service. Pia's mother and sister received permission to move to the United States. It is high time, I thought to myself. The immigration office required a blizzard of paperwork, even more than when Pia and I got married. There was always another form, document, or record that needed to be submitted, executed, or completed, and of course, always in triplicate. The treaty that ended World War II was contained on a single piece of paper. Why does the government feel the need to cut down trees in Washington state? requiring mountains of paper. After reading the message from the Immigration and Naturalization Service, I thought for a split second about destroying the letter, but just as quickly discarded the thought. Pia was always up front about everything and did her best to keep her side of the agreement. Besides, it would only delay the inevitable. We did a good job, but damn, how am I going to miss Pia? I decided that I would give her the correspondence this evening. Unfortunately, this evening... I was faced with the unpleasant task of courting one of our benefactors. This client was a classic, spoiled rich kid. Dropped out of several universities, he failed in all responsible positions in his father's companies. This man was assigned to oversee his father's charitable contributions, a position in which he could not harm the old family business. Our city had many world-class historical attractions, wonderful restaurants, and other delights. And yet this spoiled brat wanted to go to strip clubs, I never understood why strip clubs were so attractive. What a delight it is to be teased by crowds of attractive women that you will never have. It was like going to a restaurant, ordering food but not eating. What's the point? However, he was a client, and I found myself sitting in a private booth for three hours with some big-breasted blonde named Bambi, Lexus, or Bunny. He drank a lot, and I drank ginger ale. What are you guys doing? Bambi said throwing back her top and shaking her tits, looking into the rich kid's face. Oh, baby, work those things, he said. We are philanthropists. Seeing the confused expression on her face, he added, You know, we help poor people, less fortunate ones, making the world a better place. Laughing, he buried his face in her chest. You mean starving children in Africa? asked Bambi. She moved closer to me, rubbing her ass as he pushed the dollars into her crotch. Something like that, I muttered, pushing her away and standing up. Bambi was already squirming in his lap when she answered, I could never understand this whole problem. If all these people are starving in Africa, why don't they just move to France or somewhere else? He laughed and spilled his drink on me. I took a break to get myself in order. Leaving the booth, I walked up to one of the bouncers made from tree trunks. Hey, guy, I said, holding out a $50 bill. Make sure that me and my companion are expelled from here as soon as possible. The bouncer looked at the money in my hand. Sir, I do not have sufficient grounds to remove you gentlemen from the club premises. I added another $50 bill. I would also expect a light blow to my companion for this favor. I asked as the bouncer removed the money. We were quickly kicked out and ended up lying in a heap in the alley behind the club after being thrown out the back door like homeless people. I was dirty, but unharmed. My companion laughed loudly. Ron, damn it, he said, standing up. I haven't had this much fun since New Orleans. You're my type of guy. How much money do you need for this show, buddy? I chuckled and helped him up. Come with me. I have papers in the car that you can sign right now. Entering the door, I found that Pia was waiting for me. When Pia kissed me on the cheek, I saw that she wrinkled her nose. I reeked of booze and cheap perfume. Ron, why do you smell like a brothel? said Pia. Pia, I had to take a client to some stupid striptease. Dumbass spilled his drink on me. Pia looked at me warily. You don't hang out with nasty ladies? Of course not, Pia, I answered, starting to walk towards the steps. I could tell Pia was doubtful. Ron, if you don't hang out with indecent ladies, then we'll have sex right now. You have to let me give you pleasure, Pia exclaimed, pulling me onto the sofa 
and then began to undo my belt and zipper. I pushed her hands away, laughing as I did so. Wait, I have something for you. I took the INS letter out of my jacket pocket. Pia could not tear herself away from her attempts to remove my trousers. I gave in when Pia pulled my panties down. Okay, Pia, you win. I think you can wait to see the letter about your sister and mother from immigration later. I waved the letter in front of her face. Pia froze for a second, then snatched the letter from my hands and jumped up from the couch, scanning the immigration letter. Ron, this is good news. Mom and sister can come to America. Pia clapped her hands. I'll call my mom right away. We'll get ready. The phone call to Pia's mother took several hours. Operators, country codes, city codes, international lines, and waiting. It was a more complex operation than launching the space shuttle. I was still sitting on the couch. My pants were halfway down. Hey, Pia, I called, pointing to my bare penis. What about our pleasure? What about your crazy desire for me? Pia did not pay any attention to this and galloped up the stairs. Ron, you are big and strong. I have a lot to do right now. We'll have fun later today. With these words, Pia disappeared into our bedroom. It was nice to see Pia so happy. Trying not to laugh, I pulled on my pants and stood up from the couch. While Pia handled the logistics and filled out the countless forms and paperwork needed for the final steps to bring her mother and sister to America, I asked my lawyer to bring up our divorce papers. I was wondering if Pia was checking out apartments all over the city to move into after our divorce. I didn't know how much time was left before she left, so I didn't ask. In the days leading up to the arrival of her mother and sister, Pia was like a whirlwind. I don't think she slept at all. The house was washed from top to bottom. It was cleaner than a surgical operating room. Pia prepared a huge amount of their favorite food. I teased Pia that if more than one of her mother or sisters came, it would be due to the amount of food that was stocked in our refrigerator. The day finally arrived, and we met Pia's mother and sister at the airport. I've seen their photographs, but in real life, they were completely different. Pia's mom was an older version of Pia. Mom spoke good English and was quiet but firm. Sister Pia had an unpronounceable name and asked to be called Lucy. There is no doubt that Pia and Lucy were related. However, while Pia was beautiful, Lucy was taller, like a larger version of an Asian doll that would take your breath away. Lucy had the kind of appearance that made men stop and stare when she walked past. What surprised me the most was when Lucy first spoke. Hey, Ron, nice to meet you, Lucy said in a slight West Texas accent. It appears that Lucy and her friend grew up watching bootleg VHS tapes of old American TV shows. Lucy's favorites were Dallas and Dynasty. She and her friends spent hours in front of the mirror and with each other after each episode, practicing speaking like the characters in those series. Lucy watched all the seasons and knew every actor. Lucy studied their speech with monastic devotion. The voice of Alexis Carrington from Dynasty coming out of Lucy's mouth was so stunning that I was speechless. Lucy looked at me with slight panic in her eyes. Ron, darling, are you okay? Am I saying that wrong? No. Lucy, I stuttered. You said just fine, it's me. Forget it. I'm very glad to meet you too. I was lucky that Pia intervened and saved me. Ron, shut your mouth, you catch flies, put your luggage in the car. We are coming home. While I packed their things into the car, Pia, Lucy, and her mother chatted in their native language. Mom and Lucy quickly got used to it. Then I received a second pleasant surprise. Mom took over the cooking. Mom was a wonderful cook. I swear that old lady could make a brick taste like filet steak. Mom's cleaning puzzled Pia. I can't tell you how amazed I was when I one day saw my old sneakers polished and looking as good as the day I bought them. I dreaded the day when I would have to return to life before Pia. Two weeks later, we all ate another one of Mom's outstanding dinners together. However, the atmosphere was tense. I thought they were waiting for me to tell them about the move. I decided to bring this issue to the public so we can put an end to it. Pia, Lucy, Mom, I began. I know you have something to tell me, so just start. I turned to Pia. Pia, we both knew this day would come. 
I have divorce papers at the lawyer's office. Just give me a date and I'll serve them. You no longer need to put your life on hold. Pia, you can go home to Mr. Wonderful, your fisherman, whenever you want. At the words divorce and fisherman, I saw Lucy and her mother exchange glances and purse their mouths. There was a short burst of conversation between them in their native language before Pia finally spoke to me. Ron, Pia began. I need a favor from you again. Pia's sister, Lucy, interrupted. Pia, please let me. Look, Ron, darling, it's me who needs a favor, not Pia. Lucy put down her napkin. You see, Ron, I need to live in this place for six months to pass my diploma exams. Just think, maybe you'll agree to put up with this little me for so long. It brought me back. I looked at Pia. Pia, what about you? Do you want this? Do you want me to delay filing for divorce? Pia looked at her mother and sister before answering. Ron, we are family. The family sticks together. A week later, Lucy asked me to teach her to drive. Let's see. Find myself in a car with a stunning Asian babe obeying my every command? Yes, I could do that. On the second day, I was already looking for driving schools. You know the stereotype that Asian women are bad drivers? Well, there is a reason for this stereotype. The way Lucy drove, I realized that the best drivers in the world live in Lucy's homeland because all the bad drivers are dead. The only thing Lucy slowed down for was McDonald's. Unfortunately, Lucy had to swerve across three lanes of traffic to get to McDonald's. I swear McDonald's stock went up after Lucy entered the country. The delight of watching Lucy surpassed the horror of driving Lucy. After a few weeks, I could no longer hold the doorknob with both hands. After the second month, I could breathe normally when Lucy drove onto the freeway. I admit that the lessons took longer than they could have, but I discovered that Lucy has brains as well as beauty. Like Pia, Lucy was a good conservationist and knew how to not only listen but also support her point of view. One day during our conversations while driving, Lucy really puzzled me. Ron, Lucy said, looking straight ahead. I have to tell you that my sister Pia is dumb as a horse's ass. Wow, Lucy, I joked. You can't talk about my future ex-wife like that. That's what I'm talking about, Ron darling, Lucy continued. I can't believe that Pia is going to give up her marriage to you for that guy from home. Lucy, I said with more feeling than I felt. Your sister Pia and I had an understanding. It was beneficial for both of us. Oh, hell, Ron, Lucy retorted. You love Pia, both mom and I see it. I think Pia loves you, but doesn't know it. I told my sister that the day she throws you back into the pond, I will grab you and never let you go. With that, Lucy removed one hand from the steering wheel and ran her finger along my thigh, resting on my crotch. Both hands on the steering wheel, Lucy, I barked. Lucy pulled her hand away from my groin and returned her hands to two and ten o'clock. I adjusted the seat belt that was holding back my sudden erection. After a few moments of silence, Lucy spoke. Sorry, Ron. I didn't mean to grab you. I had never been with a guy and wasn't sure how to behave. Mom kept me firmly under control. I just want everyone to know how things are. I relaxed before speaking. Don't worry, Lucy. It's okay. Tell me how Pia took your claim of ownership. I don't think she cares. After all, she has Mr. Wonderful Fisherman at home. Lucy looked visibly relieved. Ron, honey, my sister Pia freaked out when I told her I was coming for you. Pia acted as if I was going to take her virginity. We quarreled a lot. My mother even intervened. I was a little confused. Why does Pia care? I'm surprised she cares. Pia yearned for her fisherman at home like a man dying of hunger yearns for food. Lucy clenched her jaw. If I tell you something, you have to promise not to tell Pia. I can't do this, Lucy. Your sister Pia is still my wife. I don't hide anything from her. Lucy's jaw dropped again. Damn it, Ron. Then I can't tell you everything. We drove on for some time without saying anything. Finally, my curiosity got the better of me. Fine. I promise not to tell Pia. Now give it up, I said. Lucy pulled the car into the parking lot and obediently backed up, just as I had taught her. 
Ron, my sister Pia's boyfriend, returned home. A fisherman guy. He already has two children from two different women. They don't even know about each other. A damn sailor who has a girlfriend in every port. I had to laugh. Wow, Lucy, this is big news. But you have to tell your sister it's not fair to her. Lucy turned off the car. Nobody knows anything about this. Not even my mother. Plus, to make matters worse, the guy Pia wants to spend the rest of her life with. He doesn't mind spending a long night away from home on a boat full of guys. He is very popular among other fishermen. I slammed the dashboard with both hands. Lucy, are you saying that he's gay? Play for both teams? This is too much. I stopped and thought for a moment. Lucy, you have to tell Pia. You can't hide this from her. Is this just gossip or do you have proof? Lucy paused before answering. I was doing an internship at a hospital when he brought a girl with a child. The child looked like him. He gave his name as his father. A month later, I was in another hospital. The same thing, but a different girl and child. I asked around. The girls live with their parents, and when he's not on a fishing boat, he lives in one house or another. Lucy turned away from me. About the guy. He's not gay. He's just... Men are men, and they use what they can. There are no women on the fishing boat. He doesn't seem to mind. There are guys like him on every ship. That's common knowledge. Lucy shrugged. Lucy, I looked straight at her. You should tell your sister Pia. No, Ron. Pia won't believe me. She is very stubborn. She still sees him as her sweetheart from her school days. It was a long time ago. Lucy stopped. She seemed to be lost in thought. After a while, Lucy spoke again. Ron, I changed my mind. You can tell Pia if you want. Lucy started the car and started driving home. I was deep in thought. Should I tell Pia? Will she believe me? And if he believes, what will it mean? A light bulb went on in my head. Finally, I admitted to myself that I loved Pia, but I needed her to love me back. If I tell Pia about the fisherman Mr. Wonderful, Pia might stay with me, but only because I was a backup option. I know it sounds selfish, but I had to be number one in her mind if we wanted to be together. On the other hand, Lucy and I became quite close, and Lucy admitted that she had feelings for me. Maybe I should let Pia go, or is it just a case of the grass being always greener on the other side? The drive home was long, and Lucy and I didn't speak. Eventually, I came up with a plan. He was giving me what I thought was a win-win opportunity. I won't tell Pia what I know about her, Mr. Wonderful Fisherman. This would give Pia more time before we parted ways. If it's true that Pia loves me, I wanted to hear it from Pia. That's how I know she chose me and not Mr. Wonderful. If Pia still wanted a divorce, I would let her go and bet on her sister Lucy. I would tell Pia what I knew about Wonderful Mr., after we broke up. Then Pia herself will decide what to do. But I will not be in sight, and she will not be able to return to me. For the first time in a long time, I felt calm as we pulled into the driveway. I don't remember the house being this happy since my grandparents died. Lucy studied and spent a lot of time with me. Mom kept the house in a condition that would please a Marine camp sergeant, and the food made me fight to keep from gaining weight. Pia and I continued to grow closer. I caught her eye when she thought I wasn't looking, but I couldn't figure out what she was thinking. Was she preparing to move? Has she thought about her future life at home? Our relationship in the bedroom continued, and this did not give me any clues. The dinners were a great time, and I enjoyed lively conversations with the three ladies. Parties and weekend events were double the fun with Pia, Lucy, and their mom. There was little I could do, so I waited for Pia's sister Lucy to finish her test and asked my lawyer to prepare the divorce papers. Everything depended on Pia's next move. On the day of Lucy's big test, Pia was at home. Mom went shopping, and I worked from my office. Pia was upstairs in the bedroom, and I was downstairs. Pia came to the office and asked me to go to the bedroom. I thought I saw tears in her eyes. This must be the end, I thought. Big kiss. I figured Pia had waited until we were alone so I could save face. When I entered the bedroom, Pia was sitting on the bed. She was still beautiful, but she looked tired. 
On the bed next to her was an envelope addressed to Mr. Wonderful Fisherman. This was strange because Pia always tried to prevent me from seeing her read or write these letters. I sometimes received mail, so these letters were not a secret. I even knew in which box Pia kept her letters. It was an open secret. Pia would tell me what was in the letter, or what she wrote if I asked. Now looking back, I see that I first began to have real feelings for Pia when I stopped asking what was in the letters. Ron, Pia began, taking a deep breath. I told him, Pia pointed to the letter on her bed, I don't want to be his wife. I wish him good luck and good luck in his future and throw away all the old letters. I'm your wife if you want. Why Pia? I asked. Why now? What changed? Nothing changed. You changed me. You make me love you. Pia grabbed me into her arms. Ron, I always knew you were a good person. Mom told me that I was a fool for letting you go. Then Lucy told me she wanted you. Now I see what everyone else sees. I pushed Pia aside. Pia, staying with me because your mom said so or your sister wants me is not a very good reason. I'm not a toy you want just because your sister thinks I have some value. Pia shook her head. No, Ron. Lucy made me see what was in front of my eyes. What you do for me, for the family, is what a real husband does out of love for his wife. Action all the time, and not... Pia pointed to the envelope on the bed. Beautiful words and promises on paper from afar. Pia, gratitude is good for pets, but it is not the basis for a lasting marriage, I told her. When you agreed to help me, it was only gratitude, but now it's love, said Pia. Of course, Pia, since when? I wasn't sure if Lucy hadn't told Pia about Mr. Wonderful at home and I was the consolation prize. Pia sat back on the bed. Ron, now I know that I started loving you last year. I don't care if a letter arrives. Pia touched the envelope. When I sometimes don't answer letters or even feel awkward, I understand that it's because of you. I'm looking for time to spend together. I even think all the time about how to postpone the divorce. I know we don't have as much money as others, but we have each other. I will do my best to make you happy. Damn, Pia seemed sincere. Time to make a decision. I had to choose a path. I kissed Pia deeply. Pia then pulled me down onto the bed and began to pull down my pants. Now, Ron, I will give you what you should have had a long time ago. Pia whispered in my ear. Was it great earth-shattering sex with angels singing? No, not at all. We took our time and I was as gentle as I could, moving slowly to please Pia. After we were in the afterglow, Pia asked me if I could get her something cold to drink. I was standing in front of the refrigerator with the door open, trying not to let the cold air freeze my balls, when I heard the door to the kitchen open. I turned, an open can of soda in each hand, naked as a jaybird, to meet Lucy, Mom, and a group of students from Lucy's study group. It's hard to hide behind a can of Coca-Cola. I took a quick sip of my soda, then asked the assembled group of women, how did the test go? Can I offer any of you a soda? A University of Texas study found that romantically based marriages are doomed to fail because partners have unrealistic expectations for each other and there is little room for improvement in the relationship. This largely explains the 50% divorce rate in America. I think since Pia and I had nowhere to go but up, we had a better chance than most. Next month, we will have been married for 21 years. Pia slowed down with the arrival of our four beautiful children. I think Pia now sleeps five hours a night. Between births, Pia managed to fulfill the requirements of the RN Commission, registered nurse, trans, and pass exams. She's been working as a head nurse at a local hospital for several years and terrifies young and old doctors who go beyond what is permitted. The whole family was at the ceremony downtown when Pia finally became a U.S. citizen. Her smile still lights up the room, and every day I love Pia more. I told Pia about my trust fund, but it didn't change our lifestyle. As our family grew, Pia bought Mr. Wilson's house next door and moved my mother there. The kids love that Grandma lives next door, and so do we. Lucy was constantly harassed when she started working, but she rarely went outside. 
Frequent trips to McDonald's led to her meeting, dating, and later marrying the manager. He was just another average person, just another faceless, run-of-the-mill, nice guy. When they filed their taxes for the first time after their wedding, Lucy discovered that he was not just a McDonald's manager, but the sole owner of a number of McDonald's franchises. With three children, they will have been married for 17 years this summer. Sometimes it's good to be ordinary.